a great pleasure to be back in Trinity College, Dublin. I'm going to talk about austerity and health inequalities, more generally about social and economic conditions and health and health inequalities. I spent a year as president of the British Medical Association and a further year as president of the World Medical Association. And I said to them, which is the opening line of my book, The Health Gap, what good does it do to treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick? When people get sick, they require access to high quality medical care. But why send them back to the conditions that made them sick? Let's deal with those conditions. This is complete indulgence. Um, this was the Italian translation of my book. Only Italian would have me doing this. You know. <laughs> and in fact, I was invited to the Trento Festival of Economics, Trento in northern Italy. And the theme was La Salute Disuguale. And when I turned up, I'd forgotten that that's why I was going, that it was Salute. And I saw this big sign and a life-size cutout of me like that. <laughs> so I had to have a photo taken of me next to the cutout and I messaged it, or whatever you call it, to my kids. And one of them came back and said, I think the cutout looks better than the original. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my daughter came back and said, nice shoes, Daddy. Um, <laughs> Uh, that wasn't supposed to be the point. But um, the fact is that we've got Italian economists to take seriously health inequalities. That's the Japanese translation and the Korean translation. And I'm showing this mainly because of complete self-indulgence. But to make the point, this is global these problems are everywhere. And indeed, and I try not to get on a hobby horse about Brexit, but we share. We share understanding, we share knowledge, we share outlooks, vital. In chapter eight of my book, Thinking About Sharing, I began with the story of Mary. Mary was found, age 14, in the yard of her grandparents' house in British Columbia. She had hanged herself. She was a First Nations Aboriginal Canadian. Mary's story has particulars, all suicides do. She'd been abused at home, physically, perhaps sexually, unhappy. The child services blamed themselves for neglect, not having taken Mary's case seriously. So you could look at Mary's circumstances and say, why did Mary kill herself? But to do that is to miss the fact that the suicide rate in adolescence of First Nations origin in British Columbia and Canada is five times the average. By focusing on the particulars of Mary, you miss the picture. She wasn't the only First Nation Canadian who saw no way out. But many other young people felt the same way. Suicide rate was five times higher. The researchers who look at this question were struck by the fact that in British Columbia, there were 200 bands of First Nation Canadians. But the suicide among adolescents were anything but randomly distributed among these 200 bands. When they asked, why was the rate higher in some than others? The first question was, what about poverty? What they called bone-grinding poverty, 
arguably First Nation Canadians are the poorest subgroup of the population in North America. But all the bands were in poverty. They looked at what they called cultural continuity, what I might call empowerment. And they classified not individuals, but communities on the degree to which the communities were empowered. Self-government, participation in land claims, and the degree to which the communities controlled health services, education, cultural facilities, and the police and fire services. The greater the degree of empowerment at the community level, the lower the youth suicide rate. This is preventable. Community empowerment prevents young people from taking their own lives. And I started with this because I was asked to talk about children, and I will talk about children. But also, it illustrates the importance of psychosocial processes in the mind. It also reminds us of how important mental illness is. And I say to colleagues interested in mental illness, you have to be concerned with the social determinants of health. And I say to colleagues who are concerned with the social determinants of health, you have to be concerned with mental illness. So important is it as a cause of premature morbi morbidity and mortality. As I'll say a bit later, I produced a report on health inequalities in England. It was in the wake of the global WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, and I was asked the question by the British government, how could we translate the recommendations and conclusions of your global report for one country, England? And I called my report, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, and we've been monitoring what's been happening to health and health inequalities every year or year and a half since I published my report in 2010. We put a lot of emphasis on early childhood, and I'll get to that in a moment. But in last year's report, 2017, we drew attention to this phenomenon. Since about 1920, from 1921 to 2011, 90 years, life expectancy improved, increased for men and for women by about 23 years. That's one year every four years. Wow, that's amazing. It means if you worked for six hours today, you got that for nothing. You, life expectancy was as long at the end of those six hours as it was at the beginning, every day. One year and four, six hours every 24 hours. It's absolutely amazing. And then, 2011 to 15, it collapsed. It slowed down dramatically. Rate of increase 0 0.02 years every year for women and 0 0.07 years every year for men. When we published this in 2017, Jeremy Hunt, Secretary of State for Health, tweeted, respect Marmot. And I thought, did he have a question mark at the end of that? <laughs> respect Marmot? Respect Marmot. But since he was on the BBC this morning, life expectancy for men has increased by 61 minutes. I tweeted back, what are you saying? That the Office for National Statistics has got its figures wrong? And that the increase in life expectancy is not slowed down? Question mark. If ONS is right, let's discuss. One colleague tweeted, ooh, Jeremy Hunt's picked a statistical fight with Marmot. <laughs> My money's on Marmot. <laughs> 
if I do a tweet that's popular, it might get tweeted, retweeted 23 times. This was retweeted 110,000 times. Um, so it obviously hit a nerve. Um, so it obviously uh, hit a nerve. I said, I wrote to Jeremy Hunt, and I said, you should take this with the same seriousness as you would a winter bed crisis. He did. He ignored the fact that we now have a winter bed crisis, and he ignored that. That isn't quite what I meant, but one question I was asked was, well, maybe we've reached peak life expectancy. It's got to slow down sometime. Can't go on forever, can it? Well, that's a reasonable question. So we looked across Europe at different European countries. You're asking, is Ireland there? Yeah, it is. There it is. And the UK between 2005 and 2010 looked about average. Not great, but about average in terms of the increase in life expectancy. This is males. And then what we see 2011 to 2015, there was a slowdown in most European countries. Again, Ireland, not much of a slowdown, but most European countries had a slowdown in the increase. But the UK was now second bottom. And for women, the UK was bottom. So it's a reasonable question to ask, had we reached the peak? But the answer is no, because other European countries were continuing to increase, and we weren't in the UK. We were lagging behind Ireland. Now, what I did say is simply saying its austerity is too simple. I did draw attention to the fact that the increase in funding of the NHS had slowed down dramatically, and the spending per person was due to go down, and that will, of course, have a particular impact on older people, that the adult component of social care spending had gone down by more than 6% from 2009-10 to 2015, at a time when the elderly population 65 and above increased by about one-sixth. So the social care spending per person went down. And both those reductions will have an impact on the quality of life of older people. But I said, I don't know if it would impact on the length of life of older people, but it was urgent to try and find out. Soon after we published our report, there was this report from Manchester looking at north-south mortality, and I drew out the figures for young people, 25 to 34 is young, for me. Young people, uh, men and women, aged 25 to 34. And what you can see is that in the 1980s, there was no north-south difference in mortality, and mortality was going up in young people, both in the north and the south. I remember at that time I was on a government committee on the health of the nation, and we were worried by the increase in suicide in young people. And everybody's wringing their hands saying, why could young people have this increase in suicide? I said, unemployment? And the chair of the committee said, there's no link between unemployment and suicide. Next item, we moved on. I went to him afterwards and said, what do you mean there's no link? between unemployment and suicide. And he said, well, it's not a one-to-one -one association. <laughs> I said, if it were, it would solve the unemployment problem. <laughs> it's 
so young people were killing themselves and alcohol-related and violent deaths. And then what you see is the mortality comes down in the South, starting in the mid to late 1990s, while it's continuing to rise in the North, and then subsequently comes down in the North. Now, I think you can see industrial policy writ large in these figures. The scorched earth industrial policies of the 1980s with mass unemployment is giving people no hope for the future. And they're abusing themselves with alcohol and drugs and violence and killing themselves. The third report that I want to draw attention to is the question, can social policies make a difference? There have been some papers that say if government policy could reduce health inequalities, then England and Wales, United Kingdom, is the place to look because under New Labour they had an explicit policy of reduction of health inequalities and if any country could reduce it, the UK could. And it didn't work, they said. Well, a recent paper from Liverpool compared the most deprived 20% of local authorities with the average and looked at what happened to the life expectancy gap, the gap between the most deprived 20% and the average in England. 1983 to 2003, the gap was increasing for males and for females. Inequalities were getting bigger. There was a break in the data, which they thought roughly corresponded to the fact New Labour was elected in 97, took a while to elaborate a set of policies and implement them. And then in the period from 2003 to 2012, the gap got smaller year on year. Health inequalities got less. New Labour left coalition government 2013 to 15, the inequalities grew again. It's consistent with saying that social policy makes a difference. You can make health inequalities smaller, and if you're minded to, you can make them bigger. I waste so much of my time looking at the US news. Somehow, I don't know why I should feel it personally of what's going on in the US, but I do. It's somehow, we're all part of this global community. And so I ask myself, does the US represent the future? As you've probably read, life expectancy in the US declined two years in a row. Try and think outside wartime of a rich country where life expectancy declined two years in a row. And related to it, this paper two years ago, and it was updated a couple of months ago, a few months ago, by Anne Case and Angus Deaton, looked at mortality in men and women aged 45 to 54. What you can see is that it was declining in France, in Germany, in the UK, Canada, Australia, Sweden. Big differences between France and Sweden, but in all these countries, mortality was declining, as it was in US Hispanics. And in US non-Hispanic whites, the mortality was rising. And the causes of death underlying this rise in mortality, number one, poisonings due to drugs and alcohol. Number two, suicide. Number three, chronic liver disease, which is alcohol-related. Case and Deaton called these deaths of despair. I said I wanted to talk about psychosocial causes. These are not medical causes. Well, they, 
the opioids are to some extent medical malpractice because of overprescription of opioids that people are using to commit suicide. And the fewer the years of education, the steeper the rise. So the inequalities are getting bigger. America has the highest drug death rate in the world. Somebody from Penn State University looked at the geographic distribution of deaths from drugs, alcohol and suicide. And you can see it very clearly in the industrial Midwest. It looked at voting for Donald Trump and the higher the vote for Donald Trump, the higher the death rate from drugs, alcohol and suicide. <laughs> I'm assuming that it was not people who committed suicide that voted for Trump. Um, they didn't kill themselves and then vote for him, but they voted for him and he may well kill the rest of us. Now, Trump didn't cause these deaths. In some sense, these deaths caused Trump. And by that I mean, they looked at a measure of economic distress and the higher the economic distress, the higher the vote for Donald Trump. So it's consistent with saying disaffected white working class under economic stress vote for a, a populist, a snake oil salesman, and have high rates of mortality from these deaths of despair. And mental and behavioural disorders such as dis depression, anxiety and drug use are the primary drivers of disability worldwide. Risk factors for depression in our Commission on Social Determinants of Health, we had a knowledge network that looked at the evidence and they said the evidence for low socioeconomic position, low education, unemployment, underemployment were very convincing and was strong for food insecurity and early nutrition deficiency, gender inequity and low in income. So you can see that social and economic circumstances and inequalities in social and economic circumstances are big drivers of depression and mortality from drugs, alcohol and suicide. I'm coming to childhood, really I am. If you look at depression and suicide, drugs and crime by childhood behavioural problems um, from Dunedin. Here we've got the top 50% with no conduct problems, 45% with some conduct problems in early childhood, and the bottom 5% with conduct disorder. The more problems in early childhood, the higher the crime rate, the higher the problem with drugs, higher depression and higher risk of suicide and it starts with problems in early childhood. It was trying to put this kind of evidence together that led me into chairing the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. We called our report Closing the Gap in a Generation and we put at the heart of what we were trying to achieve empowerment of individuals, of communities and indeed of whole countries. And we said that empowerment had a material dimension. If you can't afford to feed your children, you can't be empowered. A psychosocial dimension, having control over your life. And a political dimension, having voice. So we said we wanted to create the conditions for people to have control over their lives. And as I mentioned earlier, in the wake of the CSDH, I did the so-called Marmot Review, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. And my assumption from reviewing all of this evidence 
is the mind is the principal gateway by which the social environment, social determinants affect ill health, impact on mental illness and well-being, and psychosocial pathways to physical illness. The world's discovered non-communicable disease and the risk factors for non-communicable disease are behavioural. Smoking, drinking, lack of exercise, obesity and the like. But a behaviour is driven by what goes on in the mind. The social environment acts on the mind to influence people's likelihood of taking up certain behaviours. And then, of course, there are stress pathways. I've been somewhat exercised by Glasgow. Come back for a moment. When we reported the findings of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, I was trying to make common cause between inequalities in health between countries and inequalities within countries. And I pointed out that in Glasgow, the gap in male life expectancy between Calton, a deprived down at Hill part of Glasgow, and Lindsay, a much richer area, 11 kilometers away, the gap was 28 years. Life expectancy in Calton for men was 54, and in Lindsay was 82. 28 year gap in life expectancy in one Scottish city. We have health inequalities right on our doorstep. And so I was intrigued when I was shown these data, a comparison between Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester, three post-industrial cities, similar levels of poverty and inequality. But Glasgow has higher mortality than Liverpool and Manchester. And the causes, drug-related poisonings, alcohol, suicide. Does that sound familiar? That's the rise in mortality in non-Hispanic whites in the US. The same set of causes and external causes of death. Harry Burns, former Chief Medical Officer of Scotland, said a major element of the excess risk of premature death is psychosocially determined low sense of control, self-efficacy, and self-esteem. So in my English review, we had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions. Number four was really radical. In a rich society, everyone should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. Number five was healthy and sustainable places to live and work, housing, the environment. And number six, taking a social determinants approach to prevention. Starting with early childhood, these are data from the Millennium Cohort Study on socio-emotional difficulties in children at ages three and five by parenting activities. So we asked parents of children age three, was it important to talk to a child? About 20% of parents denied that it was important to talk to a child age three. And that followed the social gradient. The lower they were in terms of income, the more likely they were to deny that it was important to talk to a child age three. Is it important to cuddle a child? About 20% of parents denied that it was important to cuddle a child age three. And that followed the social gradient. Talking, cuddling, playing, singing, normal stuff that parents do with children. The lower people were in the hierarchy, the less likely they were to do those things. And that accounted for about half 
of the social gradient in socio-emotional difficulties at age three and at age five. And then we looked at verbal ability at age three and five. The lower the, you were in the hierarchy, a child was in the hierarchy, the less developed their verbal ability. And again, about half, a bit under half of that was explained by parenting activities. I presented data like this after I published the English Review to a group of 26 chief executives of local government and chief executives of what then were primary care trusts in England. And one chief executive in local government leapt to her feet and said, we should implement this this afternoon. What are we waiting for? We need to help parents become good parents. And if the parents can't do it, we can support them. So we've been monitoring what's been happening. And if you look at level of development at age five, look first at the blue dots, the top graph. Try and ignore the red dots for a moment. For every local authority in the country, we've got measurements of the proportion of children who have a good level of development age five. And you can see the more deprived the area, to the left as you look at it, the lower the proportion of children age five who have a good level of development. The more affluent the area, the higher the proportion. So one strategy to improve early child development is reduce deprivation. Bring the level of those more deprived communities up towards the middle and you will improve the proportion of children age five with a good level of development. It's one strategy, and it's highly likely to work. But there is scatter around the line. Now look at the red dots. The red dots are children eligible for free school meals. So it's a poverty measure that we use. It's a means-tested benefit, free school meals. So these are the poorer children. You mentioned in your introduction about truth and facts. When I saw these data, I thought, that's not what I predicted. The slope goes the other way. The more deprived the area, the better do the children eligible for free school meals perform on these tests. I did not predict that. So I did what any scientist would try and do, is get rid of inconvenient data. <laughs> it's much easier to change the data than change your views. So I thought, we must have made an error. Let's check the coding. But it's still there. Oh dear, this was more uncomfortable. I had to change my ideas rather than can't change the data. So I had to change my ideas. So I went to some deprived areas of London. Hackney, for example. If you look at the average in England, 60% of children have a good level of development age five, and children that are eligible for free school meals, just under 45%, the gap is under 16% close to 16%. Now look at Hackney, a deprived area of East London. When I say deprived, I think the price of housing's gone up in Hackney since I got out of bed this morning, but <laughs> there's still a lot of deprivation in Hackney. 65%, the children, deprived kids, eligible for free school meals, are doing as well as the English average. And the gap between the deprived kids and the average in Hackney is only 4%. The director of education in neighbouring Tower Hamlets said to me, we tell ourselves every day, poverty is not destiny. Now look at Bath and North East Somerset. I caught the train to Swansea in Wales and as it went through Bath Spa, I called out, what do you do for poor kids in Bath? 
and I imagined, I'm not hearing voices, but I imagined somebody calling back, poor kids? We didn't know we had any. Beautiful Bath, Georgian spa town. Well, that may be the issue. If you don't focus on it, the gap is 30%. They do really poorly. Whereas in Hackney, if you don't focus on poor children, what are you doing getting out of bed in the morning? There are so many of them. This is really encouraging. I'm so pleased that I looked at the data. This suggests we can make a difference. So the two strategies, one, reduce poverty and deprivation, and the second, break the link between poverty and deprivation by focusing on improving early child development. Can we reduce poverty? Well, yeah, we can, actually. This is child poverty levels, less than 60% median income. I talked about the US. The US is amongst, has amongst the highest poverty level of any OECD country, any of the rich countries. Spain, Mexico, Bulgaria, Turkey, Israel, and Romania have higher poverty levels, but then the US. There's the UK and the usual suspects, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, Finland, uh, Korea, down here at the lowest poverty levels. And reducing poverty by social transfers. So in Finland, they reduce poverty by 70%. If you compare gross with net, so child poverty before taxes and transfers, and then what child poverty is after taxes and transfers, in Finland, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Ireland, and Sweden, dramatic reductions in poverty as a result of taxes and transfers. The Minister of Finance has in his hand, there are always men, the Minister of Finance, they let women do caring things, but the men, you know, tough guys. The Minister of Finance has in his hand the lever that can make a huge difference to health inequalities by impacting on child poverty. The other side of what happens in early childhood are adverse child experiences, like Mary, the First Nation Canadian teenager, experienced of abuse. And looking at the number of adverse child experiences and all-cause mortality, less than 50 years of age, the more adverse child experiences, the higher the premature mortality. And if we look at ACEs, adverse child experiences, by income, incarceration, drug abuse, sexual abuse, alcohol abuse, domestic violence, physical abuse, mental illness, verbal abuse, and parental separation, pretty well all of them get progressively more common as you go down the social hierarchy. So we're now seeing this social gradient, lower position in the hierarchy, increased likelihood of adverse child experiences, and adverse impact on children's development, including psychopathology. So if we look at adverse child experiences, in theory, if you could prevent children from having numerous adverse child experiences, you could reduce the likelihood of early sex before the age of 16 by a third, unintended teen pregnancy by 38%, smoking by 16%, binge drinking. Look at this one. Violence perpetration in the last year. Half the perpetrators of domestic violence had experienced several adverse child experiences. And you could reduce domestic violence by half by in theory, eliminating adverse child experiences. And look at this, even more chilling. Half the victims of domestic violence 
had numerous adverse child experiences. And globally, one in three women will experience physical and or sexual violence by a partner or sexual violence by a non-partner. One in three women globally. Education. We know the predictors of doing poorly in school. If we look at, at um, cognitive test scores at age seven, the more of these risk factors you have, the lower the cognitive scores. Low birth weight, not being breastfed, maternal depression, lone parent, low family income, parental unemployment, low qualifications of mother, damp housing, social housing, and area deprivation. These are the predictors of doing poorly. I, I could tell you lots about all of these, but you probably don't want to stay here for as long as I'd like to keep you here, so <laughs> I'll skip over some of them. But this ensure healthy standard of living for all. Now, let me sound like Bernie Sanders for a moment. I can't do that. <laughs> the Bernie Sanders thing. Um, this is the share of the share of total household income enjoyed by the top 1%. In 1928, the top 1% of households had 23% of total household income. And you remember what happened next, the great crash of 1929. And the share of the top 1% came tumbling right down to 10% or a bit lower. And during this period of unparalleled economic growth in the US, the top 1% had about 10% of total household income. And then in the late 70s, early 80s, it took off. And by 2007, the top 1% again, had 23% of total household income. And you remember what happened next? The global financial crisis. Now, I work in a university. I know that correlation is not causation. And it's not proved that the unconscionable greed of the top 1% brought the global economic situation of the world to its knees. But you have to admit, it's a credible hypothesis. And we know that as the economy recovered in the US, that every dollar of economic growth, 92 cents, went to the top 1%. Now you're starting to understand the Trump voting and maybe the Brexit voting in the UK. And so what happened in the UK, this is the long run impact of tax and benefit reforms introduced between May 2015 and April 2019 by income deso. So look at working age families with children. As a result of changes to the tax regime, people in the bottom decile of income, the poorest 10%, we'll get something like 9.5% drop in income. The next decile will get greater than 12% drop in income. And then the richer you are, the less drop in income. So this is an explicit government policy to increase inequalities. Saying to Richard, or Richard was saying to me, I say, and it's true, that I don't make party political comments publicly. I vote in elections, but that's my business. I don't make party political comments publicly. I'm concerned about the impact on health inequalities. And this, other things equal, will have an adverse impact on health inequalities. Uh, the rationale, supposedly, for these regressive policies and policies of austerity is that it's supposed to have made the UK the envy of the rich world. 
Well, this is international average real wage growth from 2007, the onset of the global financial crisis, to 2015, figures from London School of Economics. So Greece got 13% decline in real wage growth. The UK got an 8% decline, then Portugal, and everybody else got an increase. And we were being told in Britain that we were the envy of the rich world. Our economy was doing better than everybody else, and it was a lie. And I think people in the north of England who'd been lied to consistently and then told at the time of the referendum about Brexit, you know, if we exit the European Union, you'll be worse off. Well, they've already been lied to about how well off they're supposed to be. And they know when they go to the supermarket this week, they could buy less with the same amount of money they could a year ago. So why believe them? I think once you get into lying in public life, there's no telling where it'll go. You get Trumps, you get opioid poisonings, you get goodness knows what, you get Brexit and the like. But I'm not going to finish on that note. I'm going to finish on a good note. I spent the year 2015 to 2016 as president of the World Medical Association. And I said, I have two messages, evidence-based policy, presented in a spirit of social justice. I happened to be wandering in the mall in Washington, D.C., and found myself in the area devoted to Martin Luther King. And he said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love. And I thought, unarmed truth? Well, evidence-based policy is a bit more prosaic an unarmed truth, but it's the same thing. And spirit of social justice, that'll do for unconditional love. Yeah. So I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. That is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. So my mission for my presidency and my life is health equity through action on the social determinants of health. And I talked about what doctors can do, but I want to talk about working in partnership. I was invited by the ABC, Australian Broadcasting Commission, to do some radio lectures, a bit like the Reef lectures in Britain, but they're the Boyer lectures, the ABC wouldn't like me to say that it's like the BBC, but anyway, the, the ABC. And the Australian Medical Association wrote to me, I'd met them through the World Medical Association, and said, we heard you're coming, can we help you? And I said, yeah, I'd like to see doctors in action on the social determinants of health. What can you show me? Well, they're very concerned in Australia about the gap between in health between Indigenous Australians, Australian Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders, and non-Indigenous. 10.6 years for men, 9.4 years for women. So I was taken to the Tharawal Aboriginal Corporation, a community centre 50 kilometres south of Sydney, and shown around by two Aboriginal women. They have doctors, specialists and the like. This is the belly cast program. Aboriginal women tend not to attend antenatal classes and antenatal care. So they got women to take plaster casts of their pregnant torsos and decorate them with Aboriginal art. Lovely, gorgeous, and the women love it. So they come. And then once they come, um, before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after the birth of the baby. They got legal services and the like. Children. When I was there, the little children were just being put down for, to their afternoon nap. And I said to the young woman who was in charge of this part of the campus, I said, how do you know if these children are developing normally? 
and she took a stack of forms off the shelf with 30 indicators for each child with these indicators of social, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, linguistic development. I said, where'd you get these from? She said, from the university. So up to the minute, monitoring how well these children are doing. And the older children, the Deadly Homework Club, drugs and alcohol. When I got to this particular part of the centre, I said to the woman who was running it, you must have the, the most difficult job in this whole centre. And she said, no, I have the most rewarding job in this whole centre. And she took me and showed me an Aboriginal painting on the wall. She said, the man who did this, when he came here, he was, had problems with drugs and alcohol and domestic abuse. And we helped him put his life back together. And when he left, he came back with this painting that he'd done as a gift. I have the most rewarding job. Subsidised fruit and vegetables. And this is grannies against removal, the older women. Children, there was a vogue to remove children from the families, Aboriginal children, and try and breed the Aboriginal out of them, to bring them up white, with disastrous consequences, both for the children and the family. And now children are still being removed because of domestic violence and the like. And so these are the older women saying grannies against removal. I was asked when I arrived in Australia, we've spent billions trying to close the health gap between Aborigines and non-Aborigines. What are we doing wrong? And I said, I just arrived. Give me 24 hours, then I'll give you the answer. <laughs> well, the psychologist in this part of the centre gave me the answer. If you spend 200 years systematically depriving people of their dignity, of control over their lives, of the chance to lead a flourishing life. It's hardly surprising that simply giving them money is not enough to solve the problem. I mentioned that I was giving these lectures and the ABC has something, it's not called question time, it's called Q&A, but it's like question time. And they made the theme the week I was there inequalities to trail the lectures I was giving. And the compare, the Dimbleby person, um, asked me about income inequality. And so I said, which was in my lecture and in my book, what do the 48 million people who make up the population of Tanzania have in common with the seven million people who make up the population of Paraguay and the two million people who make up the population of Latvia and the 25 top earning hedge fund managers in New York? And the answer is the previous year, each of those groups had a combined income around $25 billion. Imagine, I said, here's a thought experiment. Suppose the hedge fund managers gave up their income for one year. They wouldn't miss it. They're going to earn a billion dollars each the next year. And we transferred that 25 billion to Tanzania. We double the per capita income. And I'm not suggesting just giving it to individual Tanzanians. But think of the clean water you could pipe to the villages, the clean cook stoves the nurses and teachers. Suppose, I said, unlikely as this might seem, that the hedge fund, uh, hedge fund manager said, we couldn't care about Tanzania. I know that seems unlikely. Here's an even more fanciful thought experiment. Suppose they paid a third of their income in tax. I know. <laughs> you and I pay a third of our income in tax, but 
if they paid a third of their income in tax, you could employ 90,000 New York school teachers. And someone else on the panel said to me, you're in fantasy land, mate. You're in complete fantasy land. Trying to think on my feet, I said, Hapdan Mala, the legendary director general of WHO, said the idealists of today are the realists of tomorrow. And the next day when I went to the Tharawal Health Centre, I was greeted. <laughs> <laughs> so I say to you colleagues, come and join me in my fantasy land and we will make the world a fairer and more just place. Thank you very much for a lovely lecture. But is it all economics? I'm really struck by the contrast between non-college educated white Americans and Hispanics, where the economic factors, I imagine, are not that different, but where there's this vast difference. And I was also thinking the comparison between Hackney and Bath and Somerset. And is it not possible that there are cultural, for instance, the stability of the family, uh, the stability of communities, cultural factors which are maybe just as important as the economic ones in determining some of these important variables? Yeah, I think it's, it's highly likely. I mean, I was often asked after my English report, what's the single most important thing you would recommend? It's income, isn't it? And I said, no, if I thought I only had one thing to recommend, I would have only made one recommendation, but I made six. And that I don't think it's all income. Income's important, but look at caring for children, for family, breaking the link between deprivation and good early child development adverse child experiences. Now, they do get more common as you go down the social hierarchy, but it's not ineluctable, it's not inevitable. There can be real differences. And in fact, when I was talking to people in Tower Hamlets about inequalities in Tower Hamlets, the Bangladeshi community said, we think we're responsible for breaking the link between deprivation and poor child performance because of the strength of our family ties. Now, I don't know if that's true or it's not true, but it's an interesting hypothesis and it's certainly worth looking at. So I do think, as I said at the, right at the beginning of my lecture, that the mind is an important gateway and I don't think the only influence on the mind is economic circumstances. I think other things are very important too. Hi, my name is Meg, and I'm working in the health policy. Um, I'm interested in one Can of you your... Can you wait? Oh, I'm here, sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm interested in one of your uh, early slides that showed this correlation between um, community control of public services, presumably health systems as well, and uh, youth suicide. So I was wondering, is there evidence beyond, say, indigenous communities uh, that this could be a successful model? I'm interested in this idea of self, uh, self-determination and ownership of health systems. And secondly, if you have time, I'd love to hear your views on universal basic income um, uh, as a means to address inequality. Yeah, I mean, we, we have evidence from the Whitehall 2 study of British civil servants, and you can say a lot of things about British civil servants, but I don't think anyone's described them as an indigenous community. Um, <laughs> And we have evidence from the Whitehall 2 study that people who have low control at work have increased risk of cardiovascular disease and of mental illness and sickness absence. So that's a form of empowerment or disempowerment, having low control at work. And now we asked at the individual level, we asked individuals. So what I was trying to describe, you could have it at the community level you could have it at the individual level. And there's other evidence. I mean, we have evidence, for example, at the national level, now this is ecological, in our studies in Central and Eastern Europe, 
we had samples of the population and we asked population samples how much control they had over life circumstances. We had a series of questions. And then, I say it's ecological data, we plotted mean control against mortality for those countries. So among seven Central and Eastern European countries, the Czechs reported most control and the Russians reported least control. And there was this very clear correlation. The higher the control, the lower the mortality at a national level. Now, it's ecological, but it's consistent with saying at the individual level, at the community, and indeed at the whole country level, that disempowerment, lack of control is important. Universal basic income is an idea that we all have to consider. It's not straightforward. There are pilots going on. I was very interested, I was invited by the Prime Minister's office in Finland to go and talk social policy with them. And I said, I don't think I you've got anything to learn from me, but I might have something to learn from you. Uh, but thank you for bringing me here. Um, tell me about your experiment on universal basic income. Turns out it's not universal, their experiment. It's on unemployed people. So it's not universal. But I think we do have to think about it in relation to the progress of automation and the destruction of jobs. And the concerns people have about it are very real. How will people lead a meaningful life if they haven't got work to do? And that's a very real concern. But if we've got enough money sloshing about, but not enough work for people to do, then maybe we do have to disassociate having enough money to live on, a universal basic income, from having to work and find other ways uh, for people to pursue meaningful activities. Caring for children, caring for older people, improving communities. I mean, I can think of lots of good ways to spend time that would be to the benefit of all of us. Hello, thanks. Um, I'm here. Hello. Hi, Lisa Newman from the School of Nursing and Midwifery. Um, I'm a midwife and I was just curious about any thoughts you might have on some of the research that's coming out about the beginning of life and the effect on long-term health, so epigenetics, the microbiome, the hormonal complexities that lead to bonding and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'm sure it's vital. I mean, I start with early child development, but that's probably a bit too late. Should start with preconception um, and conception and pregnancy, um, as well as early child development. I've been talking mainly about the psychological and social inputs, but the biological inputs are going to be important too. I mean, the, the stuff, Michael Meany's work on critical periods and methylation of DNA in early life, so that handling in early life is going to set stress pathways for the rest of an animal and presumably a human's life. So I think the early environment is key. I'm no expert on the microbiome, uh, but there's a lot of interest in that area of how important it is. And you've probably seen news stories, and again, I'm not an expert on it, but the concern that caesareans, children born by a caesarean, may be at increased risk of obesity. And it's got something to do with poo, but, <laughs> um, but I can't give you much more detail than that. But um, so what happens early in childhood, early in life, is likely to have fundamental importance for the rest of the life course. Are you taking the question? Yep. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. My name is Emer. Um, I'm a gene doctor and I also do research with Prof. Malloy in pediatrics. So I really loved your book, The Health Gap, and especially how you say you're an evidence-based optimist. My question was, um, I know you're faced with so much, so many statistics which, which show so much suffering, and also people who say you're in fantasy land and popular press, which doesn't always receive your ideas very well. 
I was just wondering, how is it that your optimism and your hope always continues to endure in the face of this, and where that comes from? I had a secure childhood. <laughs> <laughs> That might be the explanation. And somebody from the BBC once, I did a BBC thing, and said to me, you're a professional optimist, aren't you? And I said, well, yeah, of course. Look, there are 193 members of the World Health Organization, 193 countries. Suppose it were the case that seven had taken my recommendation seriously. I'm not going to go around the world and say 186 countries are ignoring me. I'm going to talk about the seven that are doing it. You know, that are really, because if it's, in fact, it's more than seven. I was saying to Richard that uh, I counted up, I've now forgotten the number, I counted up during the year that I was president of the World Medical Association, I said I wouldn't go to any of those normal things and have a glass of wine, have dinner and smile and, and you know, that's, I don't want to do that. I'd only go where I was invited to talk about my agenda. And I made clear what my agenda was, my mission for life, health equity through action on the social determinants of health. So I only went to 27 different countries during my year. They all invited me because they wanted to hear about it. So, yeah, there's a lot of terrible stuff going on. But being an optimist, it could be interpreted one way, well, you think things are going to get better. Well, that I was told by a Brazilian who corrected me on my use of English. He said, you should talk about hope, not optimism. Well, maybe. But... The fact that you think things can get better, we, by our actions, can make them better. I don't think things are just going to get better. They're going to get better if people of good faith and good purpose work hard to make them better. We are going through a very dark time at the moment. I listen to people talk about how democracy ends. The Economist Intelligence Unit does a survey of 155 countries and the mean democracy level has gone down in Poland, in Hungary, in many African countries, in Venezuela, in Brazil, in the United States, for heaven's sake. Um, Britain's become a national, an international embarrassment the way our democracies are functioning. So we're going through a very dark time. But that doesn't mean it's always going to be dark. And I see the things that make me really pleased and excited of people doing things. I was invited by the Swedes to go with a Swedish delegation to the UN. I said, what do you want me for? She said, because there are 10 Marmot reviews going on in Sweden as we speak. They've taken your recommendations and they're applying them in local areas. Well, you say Sweden, of course, you know, the Nordic countries. But Brazil is doing it. Costa Rica is doing it. Slovenia is doing it. So, yeah, there's a lot of dark stuff going on. But there's a lot of good things going on too. And we have to build on those good things. And that's why I'm enthusiastic. I'm not going to get up in the morning and say, oh, it's all going to hell. I'm going to get up in the morning and say, how can we make a difference today? Because there's so many people of goodwill out there who want to hear these evidence-based messages. Maybe we should stop there. <laughs> <laughs>